And I've just found over the years that uh, the lecture recording on YouTube has maybe uh, improved accessibility and better streaming options and a great, greater variety of devices that it works on. Uh, plus, it's kind of fun to get uh, emails and contact from people all across the globe because there are people who will listen in on today's lecture from all over the place, which is just mind-blowing if you think about it. All right, so just to let you know, um, I think we've got 30 people enrolled in the course, and I see 30 people here in the classroom. Um, one of the tools that Collaborate makes available is I can look up uh, when you connected and how long you connected and if maybe there was a drop in your Wi-Fi signal and you got kicked out and then had to join again. I can see the number of times that you connected. And so it's kind of the equivalent of, uh, you know, a student strolling in late. I'll be able to know, and I'll be able to know if you get bored and bail out early. And we don't have any um, attendance component built into the, uh, to the course grade. At least I haven't done that in the past. Um, but I still do like to keep track of who's coming and, and that sort of thing. So I will be monitoring that. Um, so what we're going to do today is we're just going to take a look at the course schedule and get into the, some of the actual content. I don't like to spend too much information, uh, excuse me, too much time going over the uh, syllabus. I, I generally feel like you can access that information online, and so I'll leave it to you to do that today, and then we'll spend a little bit more time on Thursday also going over some introductory stuff. But there's just so much of it on this first day, I thought I'd uh, break it up into a couple of different parts, and so we didn't spend the entirety of our 75 minutes just going over like uh, the mechanics of the class. Um, so what I'm going to do, first of all, is I'm going to show you uh, how you can search for the recordings that we have, um, the class recordings in YouTube. And so um, there is a link in um, Blackboard Collaborate. Let me see if I bring this over, if you're going to be able to see this still. Yeah, all right. So uh, in our class page... There's a link that will take you to YouTube, the lecture videos for YouTube, and it takes you to the channel that I've got. And the thing that's sometimes a little bit confusing is that there's two search boxes in YouTube. The search box up here at the top is the search box for all of YouTube. And you can put your search in there and you'll find my lecture videos, but if you use this search, then it's only searching my channel. So either way will work, but let's say for instance that you uh, are preparing for an exam and you want to brush up on a certain topic that you knew was held on uh, class six. And so you'd say um, our class number here is 318. So 318 class six. And then you'll see the lecture videos from past years. And you know, this year's would also be on there. But it looks like class six typically covers manometers. And so then you'd just be able to uh, watch the lecture video about manometers. And if you don't know the class number necessarily, then you could always do a search for, like, uh, let's say that you wanted to get a little bit of background on Bernoulli's equation. Bernoulli, and it'll bring up the lectures that have Bernoulli's equation in the title. And you can see that the date is also included. So it's always easy to find the recordings of our previous um, class meetings through YouTube, and it's also going to be posted um, in Collaborate itself. Each one of the sessions is going to have a recording that you could watch in Collaborate if that's where you want to get it. So any questions so far on how to access these class recordings? Any questions at all? I guess it would be a great opportunity to see if anybody's microphone works. How about somebody just... Uh, Give me a quick hello to make sure that I'm able to hear audio and that you're hearing me. Very good. This is like the olden days when they all had the same phone number in like 10 farms down the down the line. <laughs> we can all talk at the same time and listen in on each other's call. All right. So uh, that is the lecture recordings. Now, the next thing I want to share with you is I believe it's probably the most important document that's posted on Blackboard for our course right now. Uh, it's the course schedule. And so let's look at the course schedule. It's a wealth of information of what we're going to be doing this semester. 
And this is available to you now. You can print it out. Ordinarily, I'd provide the, uh, the printout, but uh, we won't see each other for this lecture, though, well, not in person. You'll see me on the video, but we will see each other for the lab. I think almost everyone who's enrolled in this is also enrolled in the lab being held either Tuesday or Wednesday. So we'll talk about that. But here is the entire semester at a glance. And so I'll try to remind you in the slide at the beginning of each lecture, you know, we'll have an announcement slide and I'll remind you of uh, assignment due dates that are coming up and exam dates that are coming up. But uh, you don't have to wait for that. You can look on this schedule at any time and find out what we're going to be doing through the entirety of the semester. So for instance, if you want to find out when our first real homework assignment is due, it's due before class on Thursday, the 3rd of September. If you want to see the second assignment, there it is, the list of topics, the assignment due date. And so the homework is always, excuse me, is always going to be due before class on the date that's indicated. Uh, you can see the topic for each one of these class meetings. And through the semester, since we only meet Tuesday and Thursday, there's only 28 class meetings in the 14 weeks of classes that we have. So here on the semester at a glance, you can see we have the date of our midterm exam. And it's going to be Thursday, October 1st. You know, I've, I've taught this class now, fluid mechanics, uh, boy, like more than 20 times. So I basically know how much it takes me to get through uh, each of the topics. And so we won't need to, to shift around and adjust uh, when things are, you know, unless there's some weird pandemic things that throws a, a wrench in our schedule like it did in the spring. But I mean, what could it do to us now, right? We're, we're not immune to the virus yet, but we're certainly immune to uh, how it affects our ability to meet up on Blackboard Collaborate. So here's the semester. Uh, you can see that there's two exams in the semester and then the final. Um, I also, in the far right column, I'm listing the topic of each week's lab meeting. And so this first lab meeting that we're going to have this afternoon and on Wednesday, tomorrow, uh, it's just going to be a brief safety and equipment overview meeting. And so I want us to get all of our ducks in a row as far as, number one, the safety procedures we have to follow in order to be compliant with the university regulations that have to do with COVID. You know, namely, we're wearing masks, we're spreading out, we're only going to have the maximum number of students in the lab at a time, which is seven people can be in that lab, and that's why we've split into two different days, and within each day there's going to be the two o'clock meeting and the three o'clock meeting, and we'll rotate when that is, but uh, that's why we, we split and fragmented into so many different groups is because there's an upper limit to how many people we can put in the lab. And actually, from a hands-on perspective, that's great news. It just means that you're going to see the equipment closer than you would have before. You're going to have more hands-on opportunities than you would have in an ordinary semester. It ends up working out pretty good for the lab. So you can see that next week our lab topic is going to be surface tension and non-Newtonian fluids. And so what I'll do is I'll post the handout for that lab meeting um, in the, the, not in this Engineering 318 um, Blackboard room, but it'll go in the CE 319 Blackboard room. And the handouts will be there in advance so you can skim over the procedure and the equipment and learn a little bit more about it. So before we go any further, are there any questions related to just the layout of this course schedule and what it all means at a glance? I hear the faint boom noise. That tells me that there's a typed comment or question here. Given the circumstances, do you have lab partners or will it be a solo job? Um, Okay, and I see the other question there. All right, so uh, to address Harrison's question, uh, you'll be working, you'll finish the reports individually, but there is going to be at any given time five or six people in the lab together. And um, in some cases, there's only one piece of equipment. So we'll be doing the experiment as a single group of five or six people. And then in other cases, we have two pieces of equipment. And so you'll break into groups of two or three students. Um, 
So your reports are going to be individual, but the experiments you won't be doing individually. The other question from KC, is this a lab separate class? Should you signed up for concurrently? If you're a civil engineering student, you should be in civil engineering 319. There may be a couple of mechanical engineering students in this class, and the mechanical engineering students aren't required to take uh, CE 319. So does that answer both of your questions? And don't be shy with the microphones. It's a lot better way for us to uh, go over questions than uh, the, the typed questions. So often I just won't even notice if somebody types a question over there in the chat box. Unfortunately, it's a pretty quiet sound. Other questions? That makes sense. I'm a mechanical engineer. Thank you. All right. Great. Um, any other questions related to the course schedule? Okay, um, another thing I wanted to share with you is uh, I, when I was talking about the course schedule, I said that homework number one, this is your first real assignment. And that's because the uh, homework zero, which is available now, is kind of, uh, it's not really required. It's a bonus assignment. So if you go into the homework folder, you'll notice that there's this introduction and office hours assignment. And what it is, is uh, I'm going to be doing my office hours over Microsoft Teams this semester. And so um, I want every student in the class to make sure that they know how to place a Teams call to me. And to give you the incentive to figure that out, you know, how to place a Teams call, um, I'm giving you 10 bonus points if you place a Teams call to me uh, between now and Tuesday, September 1st. And preferably during my office hours, which is on uh, Monday, Thursday, and Friday between noon and 2. But it's okay to call me during other hours. It's just that I may be, for example, down in the lab or in another meeting and not able to pick up. So you're always welcome to try calling me, but uh, it's during office hours that it's uh, very, very likely that I'm going to be able to pick up unless I'm talking to another student already. So homework zero, you need to do by Tuesday and then Homework 1, which will be posted uh, this afternoon, I'm going to put it online for you, then Homework 1 is due on the following Thursday, Thursday the 3rd of September. All right, so that again is just in the Homework folder. You can see that the class notes are available, so that if you'd like to have a printout of the lecture notes in front of you, then there they are in a variety of different formats. If you want to have three per page and some blank space on the right to uh, to do your handwritten notes you can do that or if you want to have lines on the side three per page that's an option or if you want to really be one of those people who's going to save paper and cram six notes per page then you can get slick six slides on a page so I'd encourage you to print those out uh, you know many students like to have the lecture notes available uh, maybe like in a three-ring binder as we go through, through things together. Uh, we'll have a lot of hands-on um, examples that we'll work to, we'll, we will work together. And those examples are found in the lecture notes. It's not a separate printout. Um, in some of my other classes, I'll provide a separate printout called an in-class exercise. But in this class, it's embedded into the lecture notes. And so there isn't a, a separate group of like example problems that we're going to work through together. All right. Um, that's all of the introductory stuff that we're going to go over today. In class on Thursday, we'll spend a little bit of time going over the uh, uh, additional information that's found in the syllabus. And of course, if there are any other questions right now, I'd be glad to address those. But I'd like to just jump right into the fluid mechanics and since that's the fun stuff. But before I do, uh, are there any other questions before we uh, start talking about today's subject of fluid properties and elasticity? All right. Well, don't be shy about interjecting um, if you do have a question. Fire up that microphone and let me know. We're all friends here, right? So the, the thing I'd like you to do is uh, get a textbook. Uh, it's pretty inexpensive. Uh, I was just checking on Amazon before class, and I think that the textbook is available for uh, like $50 to rent. 
let me show you what that looks like. I'm using an old edition because the newer edition is essentially the same content, but they e they only have either a lo loose leaf or a digital version available. And I thought, you know, that's mm, kind of a racket or a scam, you know, like when the textbook publisher makes it impossible for you to sell it back or for it to be very durable, you know, you're going to just like a loose leaf is going to get ripped up. It's not going to last or a digital book, you, you'll lose the access code to that, or you, you, it just, you can't sit on a shelf in the same way that a printed book can. So this is the textbook that we're using. It's Engineering Fluid Mechanics 10th Edition, um, available for rent and purchase on Amazon and probably loads of other places as well, including our, uh, our bookstore here on campus. So please get a copy of that book. Uh, the introductory assignment is uh, Tuesday, by 5 p.m. and then homework number one submit before class on Thursday oh I'm sorry that's a mistake it's not September 10th it is Thursday September 3rd I'm glad I fixed that all right so there will be an announcement slide like this at the beginning of each of our class meetings just so that uh, you can get a sense for where things are headed All right. Well, it was probably a long summer where you didn't spend a lot of time ta thinking about uh, units and uh, the difference between SI and traditional units. Much of this class I'm going to teach in the SI unit system. And uh, I think that when you get a taste of what fluid mechanics is like with the traditional units, you'll understand why. A lot of the equations that we use to solve problems in fluid mechanics are just so much simpler if we solve in the SI system. So you'll get a taste of that, but let's just review some of the basics. Um, there are units of kilograms in SI, and the equivalent of that in traditional units when we're talking about mass is either pounds of mass or slugs. And we'll review the relationship between pounds force, pounds mass, and slugs on a separate slide in just a moment. Units of length is meter or feet, inches, yard, mile, and furlongs, and all sorts of other bizarre stuff in the traditional units. Uh, time is seconds in either unit system. Force in the SI, a newton is when we uh, want to accelerate one kilogram of mass at a rate of one meter per second squared. So we're increasing its velocity at a rate of one meter per second in every second, it requires a newton of force in order to cause that acceleration. Whereas in the traditional units, it's a pound of force is the unit system. And so it's kind of confusing because when somebody says a pound, do they mean a pound of mass or a pound of force? Well, if you're talking about the, uh, the force applied by a pound of mass under Earth's gravitation, then the two are the same. But there are a lot of other gravitational, excuse me, there are a lot of other accelerations besides 32.2 feet per second squared. You know, we can take a, a tank of water and accelerate it at any uh, acceleration rate we prefer. And so that's one of the reasons why it's a bit confusing to have the same name for both the mass and the force in traditional units. Gravity is about the same over the Earth's surface. It varies slightly based on your elevation. But um, the unit that we're going to use for gravity in traditional, excuse me, in SI units is 9.81 meters per second squared. You know, we'll use it just uh, three digits of precision. That's good enough for us. In the traditional units, oh, I'm surprised I didn't write it. It's 32.2 feet per second squared for the traditional uh, gravitational acceleration. All right, so now this slide kind of gives us a bit of additional information about pounds mass versus pounds force. Um, excuse me, one second. The air conditioner in this office is noisy, but man, it's starting to get sweltering in here. It's probably like 85 degrees in this room. Um, all right, so. In SI units, it's easy to know that a, a newton is a kilogram 
accelerated at a meter per second squared. So if we want to know how many newtons are required, you just take the product of the mass and the acceleration. In the traditional units, a pound of force is a slug that is accelerated at one foot per second squared. And so what is a slug? It's a strange name for a unit, right? So if you accelerate a slug at one foot per second squared, that means it took a pound of force to achieve that acceleration. So a slug is 32.2 pounds of mass. You know, that, that number of 32.2, hopefully that is uh, seeming a little familiar because we were just talking about how gravitational acceleration is 32.2 feet per second squared. So the way it works is that a pound of force is either a slug accelerated at one foot per second and so remember, a slug is 32.2 pounds of mass. So you can accelerate a slug at one foot per second squared, and that's a pound of force. Or, you know, there's a whole range of possibilities, but another of the possibilities is that you are accelerating a pound of mass at G, where G is 32.2 feet per second squared. So it's the same thing. It's just, you know, um, what acceleration are you using? So put a little star on this slide. You know, when you print it out, we'll come back to this slide a couple times through the semester when I'll, I'll give you a problem that uses traditional units and you'll need to refresh your memory about, oh, what's a slug again? How does that all work? Everything you need to know about the relationship between pounds, mass, force, and slugs is here on this slide. I'll sometimes pause for a moment like that so that if you want to unmute your microphone and ask me a question, that's your cue to do so. And no need to raise your hand when you want to ask a question, just blurt it out. All right. So will we have access to these will we have access to these PowerPoints? Yes, they're posted now on uh, on uh, Blackboard. Those are the, the PDFs that I was showing you a few minutes ago where you can pick how many uh, how many slides per page you want to print out, including one per page, if that's what you like. Any other questions? All right. Um, the weight is the effect of acceleration on mass. And so it is the same as a force. And so the weight of a kilogram is 9.81 newtons. In the temperature units, we will often need to keep track of absolute units of temperature, especially when we're doing gas law related problems. You may remember back to your time in chemistry using Kelvin in the gas law calculations. Well, here in fluid mechanics, fluids encompasses both liquids and gases. And so a lot of the calculations that we'll do works for both. You can uh, apply the pl principles of fluid mechanics to both liquids and gases. And so sometimes the calculations will use Kelvin. And uh, in the Kelvin system, zero Kelvin is absolute zero. The, it's the absence of any kinetic energy in the molecules in question. Uh, 273 is the freezing point of water so that if we want to convert between Celsius and Kelvin, the relationship is that Kelvin is 273.16 plus your degree Celsius. And so the size of a Kelvin degree and the size of a Celsius degree are the same but they have a different zero point. Work and energy, both of those uh, have units of joules. And a joule is the amount of energy required to apply a newton of force over a meter of distance. And then when we put a time component into that, if we are doing a certain amount of work per unit time or exerting a certain amount of energy per unit time, a watt is when you are exerting a joule per second or using a joule per second of energy. 
So hopefully most of these units are familiar, but you know we'll just begin with the basics and build from there. Quick refresher of the units that are going to be applicable for fluid mechanics. Uh, so units conversion. Of course, um, you could probably do many of these conversions built into your calculator. And at the beginning of the textbook, it also has units conversion between uh, SI and traditional units. Uh, there's the foot conversion, slug to kilogram conversion, uh, foot pounds of force to newton meter conversion, conversion between foot pounds and horsepower. Of course, we know 550 foot pounds per second is uh, a horsepower, and that's equivalent to 746 watts as it ends up. I don't expect you to memorize these conversions. Um, the uh, conversion between the uh, traditional and SI units in temperature are a little bit tricky because the degree size is different. When I was talking about Kelvin and Celsius, what I mentioned there is that the size of a Kelvin degree and the size of a Celsius degree are the same, but they're, that's not so in Fahrenheit. A Fahrenheit degree is a smaller change in temperature. So if it goes up by one degree Fahrenheit, that does not mean that it's gone up by one degree Celsius. It's only gone up by five-ninths of a degree Celsius if the temperature increases by one degree Fahrenheit. Uh, and complicating matters further is the uh, differing zero point, where water freezes at 32 Fahrenheit. And so uh, if we want to convert between the absolute um, Fahrenheit, uh, excuse me, the, the absolute units of temperature in traditional is raking and Fahrenheit. Here is the formula for that. So just uh, for example, to uh, rest my voice for a minute and to rest your brain from having to hear it, let's pause for a moment and I'm going to uh, encourage you during the semester to uh, you know, either have these notes printed out or have a, a, a piece of paper handy. And when I pause the lecture for you to work on an example, Go ahead. Go ahead and. and ooh, I'm hearing myself all of a sudden there. Did the uh, connection drop for a moment? Yeah. All right. Well, hopefully we're back now. Um, so I'm going to pause for a moment, and what I'd like you to do is convert between 46 degrees Celsius and what would that equivalent temperature be? and raking. So what you need to do is first of all convert from Celsius to Fahrenheit and then from Fahrenheit into raking. So see if you can do that with the information that's on the screen here uh, and in a moment I'll bring up the solution on the slide and we'll, th we'll talk through it together. Take a look at why it was 574 degrees in Dubai yesterday. I don't know what the actual temperature was in Dubai, but that's not far off this time of year. It gets hot over there. All right, so temperature conversion. Um, 46 degrees Celsius. First of all, we have to find out how many Fahrenheit degrees that is. And so we are converting for the size of the degrees. And so 46 Celsius degrees is the same as 82.8 Fahrenheit degrees. So that's just talking about how many increments, can you see my finger, how many increments there are, you know, how much the thermometer went up above the baseline. Now we need to add on the baseline, which is the freezing point. And in Celsius, that was zero. But the freezing point in Fahrenheit is 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So first of all, converting between Celsius and Fahrenheit, it is 114.8 Fahrenheit in this example. And I think I saw a headline the other day that they recorded 130 Fahrenheit somewhere in Death Valley. Did anybody else see that uh, headline? That's bananas. 130 degrees. Um, so once we have the temperature in Fahrenheit, then we convert it over to raking just by simply adding 460. So it's however many Fahrenheit degrees there are plus 460 to get us to the raking. So it's a two-step process. First you go from Celsius to Fahrenheit, then from Fahrenheit to raking. 
All right. Next, let's review some uh, properties that are related to a system's mass or weight. And um, first of all, when we talk about the density of a fluid, what we mean by that specifically is the mass of fluid relative to the volume that is occupied that, by that fluid. And so water, for instance, in one cubic meter of water, the mass is at the standard temperature of, uh, I think, 10 degrees, cel 10 degrees Celsius is 1,000 kilograms. So a cubic meter of water would have a mass of 1,000 kilograms. That's its mass density. Um, a lot of people are familiar with the density of water as being one gram per centimeter. We're going to be thinking in bigger terms. You know, a, a cubic centimeter is pretty small. A uh, cubic meter, now you're talking some real water. So density of a fluid is its mass divided by the volume. And so uh, water at 10 degrees Celsius is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. Um, and, that, you know, that's not coincidental. That's kind of how they defined what a, uh, a kilogram was, is they used water as the baseline. And, uh, and so they, they set it so that it would be... A, by definition, 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, or a, one kilogram per liter. That's another, you know, a liter of water has a mass of one kilogram. In the traditional units, it's 1.94 slugs per cubic foot. And that's not by definition. That's just what it works out to be when you have, uh, you know, some random amount of mass back in the Middle Ages. It is, was defined as a pound. So it, there wasn't, you know, it's not a unit system by design. It's kind of a unit system by evolution, whereas the SI system is units by design. Specific weight is maybe something that you have. Maybe you haven't heard about it, but we use it a lot in fluid mechanics. This is really important. And so we use the symbol gamma for that. That's the Greek symbol gamma. And so it is the density multiplied by the uh, uh, gravity that the fluid is uh, experiencing. And so it's the weight of the fluid divided by the unit volume. And so in the case of water, there are 9810 newtons per cubic meter at 10 degrees Celsius. And so that's the weight of the water per meter of volume. Whereas uh, in the traditional units, it's 62.4 pounds of water in a cubic foot. That's pretty heavy, right? 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. So that's specific weight. So remember, the relationship between specific weight and density is if you need the specific weight, just multiply density by G. So 1,000 multiplied by G, which is 9.81, that's where you get 9810 newtons per meter cubed. I'm going to turn off that air conditioner. It's so noisy, I think I'd rather roast than listen to it anymore. I don't know if you could hear it, but it was like a mosquito was inside my eardrum. All right, so um, <clears throat> one of the differences between liquids and gases, both of which are fluids, remember, fluid mechanics encompasses liquids and gases. Uh, one of the differences between those two different classifications of fluids is their compressibility. And so just using one liquid and one gas as an illustration, we know that water is not very well compressible. Um, some people call it incompressible, but if you apply enough force, it compresses a little bit, just a little bit. But wa uh, So water is not very compressible, but air is really compressible. And so that's one of the ways that we can uh, distinguish between fluids. Um, and uh, even though water is relatively incompressible, that doesn't mean that its density is always the same. Because we could change the density of water depending on whether salts are dissolved in it. And of course, the density of water also varies as a function of temperature. So both of these times when I was talking about the mass density and the specific weight, you'll notice that it was saying what temperature that was at. 
And so I'll show you a slide in just a moment that uh, shows the effect of temperature on density and how fluids expand as they get warmer uh, above a certain point. So here's one more term that you need to be acquainted with and it'll just roll off the tongue and it'll be at the forefront of your mind through the entire semester because it's such an important and uh, foundational concept. Specific gravity, often abbreviated SG, is the ratio of some fluids, uh, either density or specific weight, relative to the density or specific weight of water. So, for instance, you know the oil floats on top of water, right? It's less dense than water. That's why if you have a container of oil and water and you shake it up, then the oil will separate to the top and the water will be down beneath. It's because the oil is less dense. And so from that, if you divide the density of the oil by the density of water, then you have a specific gravity of less than one. So a typical oil density might be 750 kilograms per cubic meter. Well, if you divide 750 kilograms per cubic meter by 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, which is the density of water, then that would give you a specific gravity of 0 0.75. So Specific gravity is just a ratio, and when it's greater than one, it means that the uh, object or fluid is more dense than water, and if it's less than one, it means it's less dense. So it can give you a hint of whether the thing will float or sink in water. Any questions about these concepts of density, weight, and uh, specific gravity? Can you repeat what you just said about the ratio? Yep. Um, basically, uh, let's say that oil has a density of 750. I wish I could write on my screen more easily, but I don't have one of those touchpad screens. Uh, so uh, if you have an oil where the density of the fluid is 750, so say 750 divided by the density of water, which is 1,000. So 750 divided by 1,000 would say SG is 0.75. And so when the SG is below 1, that tells you that the fluid is going to float because it's less dense than water. But if the SG is greater than 1, then that tells you that the fluid or the object is going to sink because it's more dense than water. Are there other questions? Okay. Now here's that table I was mentioning earlier. It shows the, uh, the relationship between temperature and both density and specific weight. So in a homework problem or on an exam, if I tell you what the temperature of the fluid is, then you should look up its temperature-specific fluid properties. So if I tell you that it's water at 50 degrees Celsius, then that's a hint that I want you to use either the uh, density or the specific weight at that certain temperature. But if I just say water and I don't tell you what temperature it is, then you can use the temperature, uh, the, the typical density or specific weight for water. And by the way, the term uh, specific gravity and specific weight, remember they're not exactly the same because specific gravity is the ratio of specific weight of a fluid to the specific weight of water. So don't confuse specific weight and specific gravity. The gravity one is a uh, ratio. Sometimes specific weight is called unit weight. Okay, so you can see that what the relationship is, is that fluids become uh, less dense as they get warmer. So the maximum density is at about 5 degrees Celsius. And depending on the charts, like if you have a really uh, detailed chart like this, Sometimes it'll show that the density at zero Celsius, while it's still a liquid, is a little bit lower than a thousand. This table maybe isn't as completely accurate as it could be. 
it's at four degrees Celsius that water has its maximum density of 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. But then as it warms, it becomes less dense. The same trend is true for air, that air uh, density and specific weight vary as a function of temperature. All right, so the last thing we're going to talk about today is elasticity and the effect of a change in pressure on a change in volume. So earlier I mentioned that um, water is generally considered incompressible and with air quotes. I don't know if you can see my fingers. There we go. Water is incompressible. That means that if you apply really a tremendous pressure to water, it will contract a little bit. And so the relationship that describes the volume change and a pressure change is called the bulk modulus of elasticity. And so this is a, uh, this is a uh, fluid property that says how much of a pressure change is going to cause a fractional change in volume. And so a, a volume relative to its initial fluid volume. And so here in the numerator of this ratio, you can see the pressure change from before and after. And so dp just means the change in pressure. So before this new pressure was applied um, versus the, the after the new pressure is applied. And then in the denominator of this, you can see is the, in the denominator of, de, denominator of the ratio is a ratio itself the fractional volume change. And so what this means is that down here in the denominator, you need to have the, uh, the amount of volume change relative to the initial volume that was occupied by the fluid. So maybe you had um, uh, an original volume of some defined amount. And we're going to work an example here in just a moment. Okay? You know, initial volume of 50 liters and then you know that you want to calculate how much volume is going to be occupied afterwards, you could solve this with the known bulk modulus of elasticity for water. You could solve for the unknown dV. All right, so KC is typed a question here. Can water compress itself? If you have a deep enough tank with enough water in it, will the water exert a great enough pressure on itself to experience a difference of density from the bottom to the top? Um, that's an interesting question. And um, we can calculate that after this example because we can look up where is the deepest point on Earth. It's in the Marianas Trench. It's called Challenger Deep. So let's find out what is the depth of Challenger Deep and then we'll calculate what's the pressure at the bottom of Challenger Deep and then we'll see is that enough pressure that it could cause a meaningful change in volume? I think the answer is no. I don't think there's enough pressure like in a natural environment like that. I think it has to be like an artificial environment where uh, an, uh, an engine or like, uh, you know, we're creating additional force. But we'll, we'll crunch the numbers on that. All right. And uh, Jeremy asks, isn't that how ocean pressures change in relation to depth? No. That's a, a good question, but um, ocean pressure changes differently than this bulk modulus of elasticity. This bulk modulus of elasticity does not describe the change of pressure with the change of depth. It's a separate concept that we will get to. All right, so Jeremy looked up the depth at the bottom of Challenger Deep. It's uh, 10 kilometers. Boy, that's deep. Are you sure? 10 kilometers? No, you said... A 109002 minus 10929. We'll look it up. All right, before we get into Challenger D, 10 kilometers. All right, so let's do this example. Uh, let's say that we know the bulk modulus of elasticity is 2.2 times 10 to the ninth giga, uh, 2.2 times 10 to the ninth pascals. So that is the bulk modulus of elasticity for water. That is a constant fluid property that describes. Um, how much of a change in pressure is going to cause what change in volume. So with that, we can rearrange this equation for bulk modulus. And the way that we can think about it, if we rearrange that equation, is that the bulk modulus is describing 
the change in pressure and the change in density of the fluid. Okay, so here's this example. We have 50 liters of water. That's our initial volume of fluid. So this V with the line through it. You may be wondering, why did I put the V through with the line through it? Well, we're going to use the letter V a couple of different ways this semester. And without the line through it, that is velocity. Uh, with the line through it, that means volume. And, you know, sometimes I'll get sloppy and lazy or forget and I'll, you know, won't put the line through it. But like when we're being really precise and we want to, you know, classify whether we're distinguishing between volume or velocity, the V with the line through it means volume. All right, so in this example, you've got your uh, scratch paper there. Uh, in your scratch paper, you've got that the initial volume of the fluid is 50 liters. And it's initially open to the atmosphere. And so then the pressure change of 5 megapascals is applied. So 5 megapascals is 5 times 10 to the 6th pascals. So if you rearrange this equation, um, this equation here, rearrange it to solve for delta V, then let's find out how much does the volume decrease. And by the way, I neglected to mention earlier why there's a minus sign here in the equation. That's to kind of indicate the directionality of an increasing pressure causes a decrease in volume. So, I mean, it's, it's obvious if you think about it that, you know, when you're compressing the liquid, it's going to reduce its volume, but that is made explicit with the minus sign in the equation there. So, in this, what I'd like you to do is here we're given the bulk modulus, we are given the initial volume, we want to solve for delta V. So, I'll pause for a moment and see if you can calculate what is the change in volume, and therefore, what is the final volume? So delta V, and then compare that to the initial volume and find out, instead of 50 liters, how much space will that water occupy after we apply this pressure? I generally will pause the recording for those moments where I'm not talking, just so that if you are watching at home, you know, you can pause it, and then when you work through the calculation, you can resume it again. Um, all right, so I have the solution here. Eric's got it, 49.8 liters. Right, so what we did was... Uh, we started with the original equation for the relationship of bulk modulus, incremental pressure change, and unit change in volume. And uh, rearranged that down here to solve for the change in volume. So you can see once we rearranged that, then I substituted in the, uh, the given pressure that's applied to 5 megapascals, uh, applied the initial known volume of 50 liters, the bulk modulus of 2.2 times 10 to the 9th. And so what that tells us is that 50 liters of water is going to have a volume reduction of 0.114 liters. So that's not very much. 50 liters of water, just for perspective, I don't know, that's like uh, a trash can is about 50 liters of water, you know, like a standard curbside trash can. Um, and so it's going to go down by a tenth of a liter. And, you know, a tenth of a liter is, you could swallow that really easily. You know, like that's, um, you know, this water bottle is 500 milliliters, and we're talking the re reduction volume is only 100. So it's, you know, a fifth of this bottle of water is how much it compressed when it started off with the same amount of water that you find in the trash can. So that's the final volume, 49.88, because what we do is we subtract the change in volume from the original given volume. All right, so any questions about that? All right, now, 
as to can the pressure at the bottom of the ocean compress the water, um, as it turns out, after running the numbers, I think the answer is yes. And let me show you why. Now, we're jumping way ahead into the course uh, to, to address this question. But because it's interesting and because we've got the time, let's go ahead and do it anyway. Um, there is an equation called the hydrostatic equation that we're going to learn later in the semester. And with apologies for my sloppy handwriting, here's how things work in the hydrostatic equation. Um, what we're talking about is the change of water depth is 1,000, excuse me, 10,000 meters. And did I have that right? That's Challenger Deep, the, the depth of, let me just Google that. Uh, Challenger Deep, um, yeah, 36,000 feet. So that's at least 10,000 meters, right, in meters. 10,984. So that's even more than I've written. But let's just say for sake of argument, if you go 10,000 meters down into the ocean, what is the pressure there? So the, the, the pressure 10,000 meters down into the ocean, this hydrostatic equation is you multiply the unit weight of the water, which is 9810 newtons per meter cubed. If you multiply that by the depth, then that will tell you the pressure at that depth. And so if you go 10,000 meters down into the ocean, the pressure is 98 megapascals. So let's go back to our example. The example that we just solved, it was 5 megapascals of pressure. And so like, what was the percent reduction in volume here? Like if we calculate it on a percent basis, we saw 0.114 liters out of 50. Multiply that by 100 it's basically a 0.2% reduction. Um, we'd see more than that. It, you know, that's very little reduction in volume, a very slight increase in density. But uh, I think that down at the bottom of the ocean, yeah, uh, you know, if we saw a reduction from 5 megapascals, you're certainly going to see a reduction from 98 megapascals. So, if you go down to there, bring enough uh, submarine for sure. All right. So are there other questions about the material that we've covered today? We uh, Just to review, we covered the topics of you know, some refresher on the units. We talked about the fluid properties of density, unit weight, specific gravity, uh, elasticity. All right. So the things that are on your plate right now, get the book, uh, call me on Teams so that you can get that introductory assignment. And by the way, if you're also in my Engineering 222 class, I think there are a handful of students that I see both this semester, you don't need to call me two times. Call me once is fine, but do put the note into, uh, um, into Blackboard because when you complete the Teams call, what you should do is go here into the homework. Oh, let me pull this up so you can see it. When you go into the homework folder, it says, you know, call me during my office hour. So click on it, and then down here, write the submission. You'll say, uh, I called you at 12.30 p.m. on Tuesday, August 25th, and it was wonderful. You know, you don't have to write some sarcastic comment like that, but just put the uh, time and date that you contacted me just because then that'll trigger some way for me to put the points into the grade book. All right, so on your plate, get the book, print out the notes if you want to, that introductory assignment, and then I'm going to post homework one so that you could, if you want to get an early start on that, you know, you could begin that as well, though it's not due till Thursday of next week, and we're going to continue to you know, address topics that relate to homework one in this coming class on Thursday and even Tuesday of next week, we're going to be, you know, covering some of the concepts. But you can always get started on some of the earlier problems because uh, some of the questions on there address the things that we've covered today, you know, fluid weight, uh, bulk modulus. So it's always good to work ahead. So if there are no other questions, that's it for today.
Thanks for uh, joining the lecture. It's going to be an interesting semester, but it's going to be a good one for sure. So I'll see some of you down in the lab uh, today, and I'll hopefully see most of the rest of you tomorrow. That's it for today. Take care.